Welcome to iTech Training's COMT exam prep course. I'm Sharon. Let's get started. Module 1 Assessments Questions in this section will comprise 46% of your COMT exam. Our first section is History and Documentation. Questions from this section will comprise approximately 3% of your exam. The Review of Systems is a list of questions arranged by organ system designed to uncover dysfunction and disease. It's important to understand that this question and answer of Review of Systems is just one piece of the clinical puzzle. The patient's responses must be interpreted within the context of the rest of their findings, including their risk factors, their past history, and their exam findings. For example, if your patient complains of shortness of breath, we would then further define this with its symptoms, including duration, precipitating events, severity, character, associated symptoms, etc. On the basis of this data, the physician can come up with an informed conclusion about the importance of this review of systems symptom and use it as a guide in their medical decision making. When taking a history on a pediatric patient, you want to ask about how the pregnancy and the birth was. Did they have a routine birth? or was it assisted with a vacuum or forceps? Have they met their developmental milestones? Also find out about their medical, family, and social history. Let's examine what happens during the allergic response. You have an initial exposure to an allergen. You may have a mild reaction, or you may have no reaction at all. Then the body makes antibodies. This period between the initial exposure to the allergen and the time that you have the allergic response is known as the induction period. The induction period can last minutes, hours, days, weeks, months, years, or decades. Then you have a subsequent exposure might be the second time you're exposed to it or could be the hundredth time. At this point, the body releases mast cells which are filled with antibodies. The mast cells release their enzymes which are histamine and this is what causes the allergic response. When you're taking a history, be aware that there are different types of vision loss. Let's talk about some of the different types. If the patient has a loss of central vision, they may complain that their vision is better in dim illumination than it is with the lights on. If it's a sudden onset, it's usually due to optic nerve or macular disease. Distorted vision can occur due to macular disorders, high myopes, or thick glasses. Frequently, if it's due to high myopes or thick glasses, the patient may state that objects appear minimized and fuzzy with curved edges. Questions regarding visual assessment techniques will comprise approximately 6% of your COMT exam. We check visual acuity for three main reasons. First, for biological reasons. Visual acuity is our vital sign and it indicates the overall health and well-being of the eye. Secondly, for functional reasons, to ensure that the patient's visual acuity meets their needs for ambulation, driving, and occupational requirements. Finally, for legal reasons, documenting the visual acuity prior to any intervention can help prevent problems as far as medical liability also, many times insurance payments may be tied to visual acuity guidelines. Visual acuity is impacted by many different factors. 
Large pupils allow more light to pass through into the eye, which stimulates the retina more. However, this does have a disadvantage because it affects resolution because of the optical aberrations that increase in the eye due to the increase in light. Small pupils reduce optical aberrations because less light is passing through the eye. However, resolutions are diffraction limited. Therefore, good visual acuity is a mid-sized pupil of approximately three to five millimeters. This is optimal as it's a compromise between the diffraction and the aberration limits. Visual acuity also decreases with age due to decrease in pupil size. So as we age, we typically need a higher level of illumination. Optical aberration can influence visual acuity. These are spherical errors, cylindrical errors, and other types of optical aberrations. And optical aberrations are not just tied to the eye itself, but also to any lens material that the patient may be looking through. The luminescence of a test object can influence the visual acuity. When contrast is reduced, it becomes more difficult to read it against a darker background. Therefore, the text needs to be made large in order for the illumination levels to be correct for good visual acuity. High illumination levels may decrease visual acuity because of a loss of contrast between the object and its background or reflections on the surface of the object. The area of the retina being stimulated can also impact visual acuity. Visual acuity is greatest at the center of fixation, which is the fovea. The fovea has the greatest visual acuity due to the densely packed cones. So once the image is moved away from the center of visual fixation, visual acuity is affected. Contrast also affects visual acuity. The legibility of the test object and the patient's familiarity with the test object. Also, the space between the test objects influence visual acuity. The laser interferometer test is also a visual preferential test. It's similar to the PAM, but it does not use a Snell and eye chart. Instead, it uses red or white stripes, which are separated by black stripes. The patient reports the orientation of the stripes that they see. This is a form of spatial frequency testing. Visual field testing will comprise approximately 6% of your COMT exam questions. In this section, we're going to talk about the Emsler grid, Goldman perimetry, confrontation fields, and automated perimetry. These are some important rules of thumb when it comes to visual field defects. Lesions in the left superior temporal retina will result in a defect in the left inferior nasal visual field. The more posterior lesion is, the more congruent or same the defect will be in the two eyes. The more posterior the lesion, the more likely that the macula will be spared. Lesions anterior to the chiasm will result in unilateral defects and posterior to the chiasm, bilateral defects. The tangent screen is a piece of black felt that has circular stitching every five degrees. It tests up to 30 degrees of the visual field at a standard testing distance of one meter. It uses a testing wand. One side of the testing wand has a white stimulus and the other side is black. You can use either a kinetic or a static stimulus. If using kinetic perimetry, you would bring the white stimulus in from outside of the seeing area towards fixation. To use a static stimulus, you would place the black side of the wand on the perimetry felt and then turn it over so that the white side was present. This would create a static stimulus. Wands are available in many different sizes. If you double the stimulus size, it expands the field to twice the size. 
If the visual field does not expand when you double the stimulus size, the patient may be malingering. It's non-physiologic. Doubling the testing set distance to 2 meters expands the visual field to twice the size it is at 1 meter. To assess a visual field in a child, the best method is static perimetry using a technique known as evoked saccades. In this method, you're going to show a moving target, then turn it off. Show the target elsewhere and watch for the child's saccades. Our next section is tonometry. This will comprise approximately 3% of your exam questions. Aqueous humor production is subject to circadian rhythms. It's produced by the ciliary process epithelium. The intraocular pressure of the eye is determined by the balance between the amount of aqueous humor that the eye makes and the ease with which it leaves the eye. As the relationship between IOP and glaucoma continues to be explored further, IOP remains the only significantly modifiable risk factor in the treatment of glaucoma. There are two theories of why glaucoma damage occurs. One theory is the indirect ischemic theory, which states that the increase in IOP causes a reduced blood flow to the nerves. The second theory is the direct mechanical theory, which states that pressure on the nerve fibers themselves cause the glaucoma damage. Treatment is initiated in eyes that have developed glaucomatous optic nerve damage and or visual field loss, or in eyes that have significant risk for developing glaucoma. IOP is then lowered to a target level determined by many factors including baseline level of the IOP, how extensive the damage is to the optic nerve, other risk factors, including life expectancy, medical history, and family history. The target IOP should be constantly reevaluated to ensure stability of the optic nerve and visual field, and to ultimately preserve the patient's visual functioning. Long-term glaucomatous damage can cause scleral thinning, atrophy of the pars placata, fibrosis of the ciliary process, damage to the nerve fiber layer, the ganglion cells, and the lamina cribosa. Because the nerve fiber layer fans out from the optic nerve in an arc-shaped pattern, the classic glaucomatous field defects are typically arc-shaped. If a patient has a sidel scotoma in the inferior field, and a germ scotoma in the superior field, they usually have a much worse prognosis. Our next section is keratometry. Keratometry will comprise approximately 2% of your COMT exam questions. In this section, we're going to examine corneal curvature and keratometry. The ophthalmometer, also known as a keratometer, is a starting point for contact lens fitting. It measures the cornea over a fixed cord length. This length is at the edge of the reflected mire on the surface being measured. A cord length is fixed distance between two points of a given circle. The Bausch & Lomb keratometer measures from 36 diopters to 52 diopters. For patients who have a very steep or a very flat cornea, you may need to increase or lower the range. You can increase the range of the keratometer to 61 diopters by placing a plus 125 diopter lens in front of the aperture, then adding 9 diopters to your reading. To lower the keratometer's range to 30 diopters, place a minus 1 diopter lens in front of the aperture and subtract 6 diopters from your reading. Automated keratometry does not use any type of doubling device. It simply focuses on the corneal reflection with an electronic photosensitive device. It records the size of the reflection and by that calculates the cornea's radius of curvature. 
Our next section is ocular motility testing. This section will comprise approximately 7% of your COMT exam questions. The most common cause of unilateral or bilateral proptosis in adults is Graves' disease. The terminology of ocular involvement in thyroid disease can be confusing. Some degree of thyroid eye disease, usually mild, occurs in a high percentage of hyperthyroid patients. Severe orbital myopathy with significant proptosis and restricted motility occurs in about 5% of patients with Graves' disease. This severe form, however, can also occur with hypothyroidism or with no detectable thyroid abnormality at all. It can also be seen in autoimmune thyroiditis, which is Hashimoto's disease. The most common muscles to be affected with thyroid eye disease, and Graves' disease, is the inferior rectus and or the medial rectus. Forced ductions will be positive for restriction in this disease. The proptosis that's associated with thyroid disease is characterized by lid retraction. This distinguishes it from other causes of proptosis. There are three types of cover tests. The cover and cover test, the alternate cover test, and the simultaneous prism and cover test. All can be performed with fixation at distance or near. The monocular cover on cover test is the most important test for detecting the presence of strabismus and for differentiating aphoria from atropia. The alternate cover test prism and cover test measures the total deviation regardless of whether it's latent or manifest. Whereas the alternate cover test measures the total deviation, the simultaneous prism and cover test is helpful in determining the actual tropia when both eyes are uncovered. That's the tropia alone. The ACA ratio is the amount of convergence induced by accommodation per diopter of accommodation. We measure this to diagnose and treat patients, many of whom will complain of eye strain, headaches, fatigue while reading, and all of these symptoms are known as asthenopia. The angle kappa is the angle between the visual axis and the pupillary axis. The pupillary axis is defined as the line that joins the center of the entrance of the pupil to a point located at the anterior corneal surface. Some literature often refers to this as an angle lambda, but in practical terms, the two angles are nearly identical. The angle kappa is especially important to refractive surgeons for their hyperopic patients. A normal visual axis is two to four degrees nasal of the pupillary center. If someone is said to have a zero angle kappa, it means that the visual axis and the pupillary center coincide. Questions regarding retinoscopy and refinement will comprise approximately 6% of your COMT exam. The Jackson cross lens is sometimes known as the Stokes lens, a flip cylinder, or simply cross cylinder. The cross cylinder is a lens with the same power but opposite signs in the two principal meridians. The lens is mounted so that by turning a knob, it can be flipped around its principal meridians or around the meridian halfway between the principal meridians. On a four-opter, the flip cylinder is moved in front of the lens. The hash marks are along the principal meridians. Usually, the negative axis powered meridian is marked with red letters and the axis of the positive power meridian with white. The stenopaic slit can locate the cylinder axis. You can also refract with a stenopaic slit. The stenopaic slit is subjective. Fog the patient to approximately 2050 with the patient seated at the usual refracting distance. Ask the patient to rotate the stenopaic slit to a position which is clearest. This position will correlate to their minus cylinder axis. 
To refract with the stenopaque slit, you refract with sphere lenses at the slit position that the patient chose. Then you refract 90 degrees away from that meridian, also with sphere lenses. Diagram the refractive error using an optical cross. There are situations where performing a cycloplegic refraction is useful and in some cases vital. Any young child who is still in the visual developmental phase or who is showing signs of reduced vision or amblyopia and or strabismus needs to have a cycloplegic refraction. Children showing a significant degree of hyperopia or astigmatism may also benefit from cycloretinoscopy in order to measure the full extent of this prescription. Supplemental testing will comprise approximately 6% of your COMT exam questions. Pentacam calculates the dimensions of the anterior chamber in three dimensions. It uses scheme flug imaging to image the anterior seg with a camera at an angle to a slit beam. This creates an optical section of the cornea and of the lens. Tear meniscus height measurement is another indication of tear volume. With this test, a keratograph or a slit lamp is used to view and measure the tear height. A tear height of less than two tenths of a millimeter indicates dry eyes. The phenol red thread test is a tear volume test. It uses a cotton thread, which is impregnated with a pH sensitive phenol red. Tears are slightly alkali, and this alkaline turns the thread from yellow to red. The test takes 15 seconds to perform, and the length of the string which was wetted is recorded. One advantage of this test is that there's less reflex tearing because there's little to no sensation of the thread. Thermal pulsation treatment is specifically aimed at addressing meibomian gland disease related evaporative dry eye. It combines heat and physical massage to liquefy and express the meibomian gland contents in an effort to get the lipid layer of the ocular surface normalized. The device consists of a small piece that looks like a scleral contact lens which slides beneath the lids and over the globe. Some physicians administer one or two drops of topical anesthetic before fitting the device beneath the lid. This lens-like piece emits heat outward to the lids while at the same time protecting the eye itself from the heat. The second part of the device, which is connected to the shield, sits outside the eye on the lids and provides a pulsatile squeezing of the lids to try to open the gland orifices and express the oil that's been warmed and liquefied by the heat. The treatment takes 12 minutes. The Hardy Rand Rittler color test is designed to screen for blue defects, tritinopic defects, and red-green defects. It has a neutral gray background with colored circles, triangles, and crosses, which the patient is asked to identify. Module two, assisting with interventions and procedures. This section will comprise 19% of your exam and includes microbiology, pharmacology, surgical assisting, and ophthalmic patient services and education. Microbiology, is approximately 2% of the exam. In this section, we're going to examine office antisepsis, universal precautions, specimens, biopsies, and cultures. Gram-positive bacteria stain blue-violet due to the presence of a thick layer of peptodoglycan in their cell walls, which retains the crystal violet reagent these cells are stained with. Gram-negative bacteria stains pink-red, which is due to the thinner wall of peptodoglycan that these bacteria have. They do not retain the crystal violet during the decoloring process. The most common strep that invades the eye is Streptococcus pneumoniae. This bacterium 
is encapsulated and stains with India ink. The bacterium will stain purple when stained with India ink. Fungi are acellular. They reproduce by using the host's metabolism. Fungi grow very slowly and cultures can take up to four weeks. These cultures are incubated at room temperature. Gram-positive fungi stain blue. Chlamydia is a genus of pathogenic bacteria known as an intracellular parasite. Another parasite, which is commonly associated with contact lens wear, is acanthamoeba. Acanthamoeba is frequently present in soil and tap water. Culture media contains specific nutrients to allow for growth of microorganisms. Culture media can be solid or liquid. Culture plates are sometimes infused with an antibiotic soaked disc. This can be used to determine the sensitivity of the microorganism to specific antibiotics. Ophthalmic Patient Services comprises approximately 9% of the COMT exam questions. The apex of the orbit is the entry point for all nerves and vessels to the eye and the site of origin of all extraocular muscles except for the inferior oblique. The principal arterial supply of the orbit and its structures derives from the ophthalmic artery, the first major branch of the intracranial portion of the internal carotid artery. The roof of the orbit is composed principally of the orbital plate of the frontal bone. The lacrimal gland is located in the lacrimal fossa in the anterior lateral aspect of the roof. Posteriorly, the lesser wing of the sphenoid bone containing the optic canal completes the roof. The lateral wall is separated from the roof by the superior orbital fissure, which divides the lesser from the greater wing of the sphenoid bone. The anterior portion of the lateral wall is formed by the orbital surface of the zygomatic bone. This is the strongest part of the bony orbit. The orbital floor is separated from the lateral wall by the inferior orbital fissure. The orbital plate of the maxilla bone forms the large central area of the floor and the region where blowout fractures most frequently occur. The frontal process of the maxilla medially and the zygomatic bone laterally completes the inferior orbital rim. The orbital process of the palatine bone forms a small triangular area in the posterior floor. The boundaries of the medial wall are less distinct. The ethmoid bone is paper thin but thickens up anteriorly as it meets the lacrimal bone. The body of the sphenoid forms the most posterior aspect of the medial wall and the angular process of the frontal bone forms the upper part of the posterior lacrimal crest. The lower portion of the posterior lacrimal crest is made up of the lacrimal bone. The anterior lacrimal crest is easily palpated through the lid and is composed of the frontal process of the maxilla. Aqueous humor is produced in the ciliary body. It travels through the posterior chamber, through the pupil, and into the anterior chamber. It drains through the trabecular meshwork, the canal of Schlem, and the episcleral veins, which are sometimes also referred to as aqueous veins. The spiral of TO describes the insertion point of the medial, lateral, superior, and inferior recti muscles in relation to the limbus in millimeters. Note that the medial rectus muscle inserts closest to the limbus and the superior rectus muscle inserts farthest from the limbus. In truth, though, these values can vary from person to person.